recording. And for this week's uh, seminar, we're very pleased to have David Frazier. Uh, so David did his PhD at North Carolina in 2014, and he's now a senior lecturer at Monash University. He's worked on lots of aspects of ABC, including misspecification, forecasting, and links to indirect inference. So we're very pleased to have him speak today. Over to you, David. Uh, thank you, Dennis, and thanks to the organizers for uh, for you know allowing me to give a talk in this session. This 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 kind of one world seminar has been a nice change of pace for kind of the COVID life of 2020. Um, what I'm be talking on today is kind of similar. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Actually, uh, kind of in the same vein of can everyone see what I'm sharing? Wait, okay, cool. Everyone good there? Great. Uh, kind of on the same vein of what I've been working on for a while now, which is really trying to think hard about how to do approximate Bayesian computation in a manner that is dealing with the case where the model's possibly misspecified. Uh, so this work kind of is a continuing thread from some of our other stuff that I've done with both Gail and Christian and Judith. And so while my name is the only one on these slides, really I could not have done any of this without their help in, in, in various different uh, guises. So what's our, what's our idea here? What's our goal? The motivation behind this talk is really the starting point of all the talks in the series most likely, which is to conduct Bayesian inference on a set of parameters that I'm going to denote throughout by theta, and to do so in the case where we have some assumptions about our underlying model, script P here, and the unknown parameters that underlie this model class are given by our prior beliefs here, which I'm going to note throughout by script pi, uh, cap, cap pi. I also meant to say earlier, please go ahead and interrupt me if you have any questions. Uh, I'm happy to take questions at the end, but please just go ahead and interrupt me if you have questions. Now, the setting we're going to be working in is kind of the standard setting of approximate Bayesian computation where the existing Bayesian toolkit is either difficult or infeasible, possibly because there are many latent variables in the model. So while we may have only a you know, few kind of structural parameters, the underlying latents in the model, which you can kind of think of as local parameters could be large or just situations where the likelihood is computationally difficult or intractable that the kind of stalwart way of doing inference in this case, I think now you can pretty much argue is, you know, approximate Bayesian computation and it's many different variants. So as more to set notation than anything, I'm just going to kind of go over what the general idea is. You know, there's been a slide like this in basically every talk in this series. So I have to continue the tradition, I think. Uh, so basically we're going to have observed data y1 through n, which is going to be a collection of observations 1 through n, which we believe come from some model that I'm going to denote throughout by p theta n, p theta not n. We have some prior beliefs, and we believe our observed sample is generated from one of the collections of this class, script, script p. Well, the way ABC works is I'm going to draw a value of theta from my model, use that in my model to generate a sample, then the canonical way of doing this is you're going to collect a vector of summary statistics. I'm going to denote throughout by eta. And then you're going to compare the observed and simulated summaries. You're then going to kind of select values or assign values of theta high probability mass that lead to an overall value of this distance between the summaries observed and simulated being small. And we're going to denote this kind of approximate or partial posterior using this kind of conditioning notation where you don't condition on the full data set, but where you condition on the summaries. Now, in the case of approximate Bayesian computation, we're basically going to select values of theta that lead to a distance that are less than some tolerance, epsilon. And we've done quite a bit of work on this tolerance and how it can be chosen, the theoretical kind of behaviors that you result from various uh, schemes of choosing a tolerance, along with many, many others. An alternative way, which has also kind of seen some uh, recent use, and it's been presented at least once in this seminar series, uh, is Bayesian synthetic likelihood. The Bayesian synthetic likelihood is a related approach to ABC that kind of goes back to a nature paper from Simon Wood in 2010, and which has kind of been popularized by Leah and Chris and David in the Bayesian sphere, at least. 
the idea is kind of similar to ABC in that we're going to calculate a distance from the summary between the observed and simulated summaries. But the way we're going to go about it is slightly different. We're going to calculate a kind of, we're going to approximate the, the likelihood in a sense with a Gaussian random, as a Gaussian with unknown mean and variance. And I'm going to use simulated data sets generated from the model to, to estimate that mean and variance of that Gaussian. Which means if you kind of think about it in a distance framework, what you're really using is actually something like the Maha Noblis distance. So you're kind of doing ABC still, you're just doing it with a different distance function, namely the Maha Noblis distance, so that when I exponentiate this and take minus one half and then exponentiate this, I can use the resulting quasi likelihood in any sort of MCM scheme, MCM scheme I want, most likely Metropolis Hastings. So We've been doing ABC for a while now. I mean, my the first instance I, I've ever heard of anyone using kind of ABC methods goes back to, I think, Rubin in like 1981. You know, it's mostly popularized in the late 90s in the population genetics literature. So I guess the, the point I'm making here is the use of ABC in many fields is now relatively commonplace, actually, I think, which means we've developed a good amount of tools and methods. So what issues really remain? And this is the starting point of this talk, at least in the sense that this is what got me thinking about this subject. Namely, I wanted to think about what kind of major issues in ABC and related methods exist still on a, on a big grand scale and possibly showing my own biases. What I came up with was statistical efficiency and robustness to model the specification. What I mean by statistical efficiency is that basically point estimators don't meet Kramer Rao, right? So the, generally speaking, because you're conditioning on summaries, the resulting inference is going to be inefficient in relation to kind of corresponding maximum likelihood estimators. And this all really comes about from the fact that ABC and either BSL, any summary-based likelihood-free method is going to entail some loss of information because there is no, in a sense, best feasible choice. Yes, you can use the kind of uh, semi-automatic ABC stuff that, that Dennis and Paul have, have you know, been rightly to point out is optimal in some cases, but the robustness of these and other kind of projection-based ABC approaches when the model is wrong is in some sense questionable, I think. Moreover, the robustness, if the model is wrong, is sort of ADA-dependent. And what I mean by that is different collections of summaries are going to give you very different behavior when the model is wrong, depending on precisely how the model is wrong. And I'll talk a bit more about this a bit later. So what's the goal of this paper? If I had to say the goal of this paper in, or this kind of research vein, if you will, in one simple sentence, it's basically to propose a solution to these two pieces, robustness and efficiency, which is, seems a pretty kind of weighty goal, but it may actually turn out to be much simpler in a sense than we want or than, than we initially thought. Uh, basically, both of the initial issues I mentioned in terms of statistical efficiency and robustness to model misspecification really come about from using the summaries, i.e. kind of summarizing the data via some low dimensional collection. What I mean is that efficiency, you lose some efficiency because you're replacing the entire data set with summaries and you lose robustness because robustness then depends on the choice of summaries you have. So this of course got me thinking logically about what's the best way to deal with this. And I went to the first place, the first place I went to was, can you avoid summarization? And we know from uh, Burton et al's, you know, 2019 series B paper that yes, you can in fact avoid summarization with ABC by the choice of certain distances. Now in this paper, what they used is the, the, the P Wasserstein distance, which basically replaces the norm on the summaries, replaces both the summaries and the distance function by a distance between the data. And what I mean is that basically you're going to look at the Wasserstein distance between these two observed and simulated samples. And this actually accords to, at least in the case of the, where P is one and the data is scalar valued at least, to basically matching all n order statistics from the sample. Indeed, when you kind of run the Wasserstein, the really cheap way of doing it is you simulate the data, you you get your observed data, you sort both samples, and you simply take the absolute difference between the two of them. And that is the Wasserstein, which basically is akin to matching all of the n order statistics in the sample, which is quite nice from, from a kind of ABC standpoint, because what it means is all the theory we've developed is really applicable in this context. 
in the sense that we know what the posterior looks like. The posterior looks exactly like the standard posterior in any ABC context. The only difference is, as opposed to having a distance between the summaries here, I just have the Wasserstein. Now, from the practical benefits of this, this actually has two practical benefits, I think, in particular over summary-based ABC measures, which is there is no explicit choice of the summaries. It kind of is agnostic in a sense about the summaries. You only choose a distance. And because you're only choosing a distance, you get to obviate the choice of the summaries. Now, it's not entirely right because implicitly there is a choice of the summaries that happens, i.e. The, the n order statistics. But the idea at least is that you obviate this choice. More importantly is that because we're using the full sample in a couple of you know, Burton et al's examples, they showed that you got much better inference, much tighter inference on, on certain parameters using the Wasserstein versus using certain summary measures. But there's a couple of theoretical questions and practical questions about this approach that I still have and that I think are still open for discussion. Namely, the, the first being, what are the existing theoretical guarantees? While they showed posterior concentration in their paper, it's unclear to me what the resulting asymptotic behavior of point estimators and kind of asymptotic normality of the posterior itself, that shape are going to look like. Uh, I think this is a bit more difficult than in the case of summaries to deal with. And it's an issue I'm, I'm, I'll talk a bit about later. The other piece is that in terms of efficiency, I don't really know of any results that say the, the Wasserstein is as efficient as say a maximum likelihood estimator, it's point estimators, if the model is correctly specified. Moreover, it's unclear really what the robustness properties of, of the Wasserstein are when the model is incorrect. So while I think the, the, the use of the Wasserstein in ABC was really extremely novel and, a, and is a fantastic paper, if, our, if we're going to go the full hog of not using summaries, basically what I'm gonna propose is there are other measures that we should also look at. And that's gonna be the heart of this paper in a sense. Really, the idea here is that because ABC point estimators are generally going to be inefficient and the resulting posteriors are gonna be wider than they necessarily need to be because you condition down to a vector of summaries, if you can get away from this by moving away from summaries, then you should open up the class of distances you're going to look at for the sum for the kind of data if you if you want to go this this data matching route as opposed to a summary based route. And really, we want to go back to those two hallmarks. A lot we want it to be that whatever distance we choose at least has a chance of giving us efficient inference and is stable to deviations from the modeling assumptions. What I mean by stable is that minor deviations from the underlying model assumptions are only going to yield minor changes in the resulting posterior. And we want both of those. And I, I do note here that there's no reason to expect something like the Wasserstein would necessarily give us that. We, we, need, some, we need some norms that may or may not have these properties. And it's gonna effectively boil down to choosing a norm here. At least that's how I'm gonna look at it. Okay, so what I'm gonna do throughout the rest of this talk is I'm gonna talk about an alternative approach besides using summaries or, or existing measures of distance where actually, depending on the norm you choose, you can get efficient point estimators, i.e. as efficient as maximum likelihood, actually. And I'm gonna show an example where this actually happens in finite sample. I'm then gonna show that the resulting class of norms, I'm going, where this new approach is going to be robust to certain types of model misspecification, and that for all intents and purposes, it's going to compare very favorably with exact Bayes methods when the model is correct, and for all intents and purposes, beat the crap out of exact Bayes when exact Bayes is wrong, i.e. when the model is wrong. We're then gonna kind of move on and compare this approach in two examples. And at the very end, I'm gonna talk about robustness to model misspecification. Okay, any questions before I move on? Okay, I can't see the chat, so I'm gonna go ahead and push on. All right. So, we're going to start with the idea of, of the Wasserstein, which is it's, it's, the good idea is to ditch the summaries, at least, at least at the start, and try for something else. But as opposed to kind of matching all n order statistics, as it implicitly does in kind of the Wasserstein one, the idea in my mind is it might be better actually to try and match empirical and to try and match the empirical CDFs. Now, you can kind of interpret the Wasserstein in this way. In one, in one, in one, under one certain case. So, in some sense, this isn't possibly very new. 
but you can choose this norm in certain ways that might be very beneficial. Okay, so basically we're gonna have our empirical measure here calculated from the observed data and the same version calculated from the simulated data. And all we're gonna do is take some norm on the space of CDF or PDFs. And I'm gonna talk a bit about which norms we wanna take. However, there's nothing different here in the sense that we know what the posterior is going to look like. The posterior is gonna look exactly like it did in the Wasserstein case. The only difference is all I'm doing is replacing a norm on the data in a sense by a norm on the CDFs, simulated and observed. Now the, the important part here is we wanna choose this norm in a way that we get inferences that are efficient, i.e. The, the resulting point estimators from our posteriors are asymptotically normal and have the smallest possible variance in this class of parametric estimators. But more importantly for me, I want these things to be stable. I want it to be the case that if my model is incorrect, not necessarily too incorrect, but just a little incorrect, that the resulting inferences don't change too much. I.e. that kind of these minor deviations from the modeling hypotheses actually only give me minor changes in inference. And if you kind of think back to put on your thinking cap and think back to kind of the 80s and kind of early 90s, this was all the rage in terms of kind of robust M estimators and everything else. But if you think about it from kind of a slightly different perspective, Donahoe and some other co-authors have a very good set of papers where they talk about using robust distances based on minimizing CDFs. And this is nothing new in a sense. The idea of minimizing these types of norms really goes back to Kiefer and Wolfowitz in about 1957, I think. And what this literature basically shows is that if you want distances, if you want norms that kind of are going to hopefully satisfy both of these tenets, you need to restrict yourself to help what are referred to as Hilbertian norms, i.e. norms that basically look like uh, like L2 like L2 norms. So two examples of this are the Hellinger distance, which would be kind of like an L2 on the space of PDFs, and the Kramer von Mises actually. The Kramer von Mises, depending on which variant you get, you can get an L1 or an L2. So that's why I say here, or any other LP variants. Now, if you have multivariate data, the Hellinger may not be the best thing to use, because if you're going to estimate this PDF non-parametrically, you're going to pay a heavy price. However, if you're going to, if that's the case, then I, then we can kind of sub in some recent work from Larry Wasserman and his co-authors, which come up with a rather nice multivariate extension to the CVM using projection averaging. Now, the really important bit here is that in, from a classical standpoint, we already know that inference based on the Hellinger metric can be efficient. And we know that the CVM dist inference based on the CVM, now we're talking about point inference here, right? Can be efficient if the parameter is scalar valued. Now it turns out that it's not in the multivariate case, but it's, it's actually not too far off. More importantly though, is that both of these classes of distance functions are known to be robust to deviations from the modeling assumptions. So I wanna go ahead and show you at least the first part of this, that in terms of efficiency, we're not gonna lose much by using these alternative norms in relation to going the full hog and using a likelihood. So I'm gonna do this by looking at two examples. The first is going to be uh, a mixture model. So this, this example kind of goes back to a JASA paper from Cutler and one of his co-authors in the late 90s. And um, this is gonna turn out to be a very useful example when we start talking about misspecification. The idea here is it's a stock standard two component mixture I have my mixture weight omega or kind of you know little omega uh, and my Gaussian density with with mean and variance guy here. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to compare a bunch of methods just to show you how this procedure works. Because from an ABC standpoint, it's exactly the same as any ABC. You just plug in this choice of norm and away you go. So let's let's compare this approach with exact Bayes, the Wasserstein ABC what I'm referred to as HABC, which is gonna be ABC using the Hellinger metric and the Kramer von Mises ABC, which is gonna be ABC with the, the CVM distance. So David, can I just interrupt yep. you a second? Of course, uh, we've, got, yes. we've got a question in the chat from Christian. Yes. He says, is there a standard definition of a CVM distance? Well done, Christian. There is not actually a standard definition of the CVM distance. It is technically speaking, not a distance. Uh, it is not, it does not satisfy the triangle inequality. Moreover, it, it may not even satisfy certain other bits depending on what the distributions are. What I'm using here is just kind of the version of the distance as the hypothesized minus the assumed minus the, minus the data 
where I integrate against the hypothesized, right? So my model-based density. You can, you can sub this out if you want to do a kind of L1 distance where you drop that hypothesized model and it'll still kind of be the same. So basically I'm just using it like you would in a non-parametric test. Does that answer your question, Christian? I can't see the chat, so. Can I? Okay, I'll just go ahead and move on. I'll assume it answered. If not, please bring it up later or just chime in. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this for uh, just one simple example. Now we're in 100 observations, but the immediate thing you see that's clear is that the densities are all very similar. So all the posteriors for mu, pi, sigma one, sigma two, for both exact bays, the Kramer von Mises, the Hellinger, and the Wasserstein are basically all pile up. Now this is very nice in a sense, right? Because it means regardless of which of these you use, you're not gonna be too far off to exact inference, which when I saw this, I was actually pleasantly surprised because I didn't know what the hell I was gonna get. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna compare this not just in a single sample, but we're gonna do it over a repeated sample of hundred replications. Then we're gonna look at the posterior means, standard deviations, the corresponding credible set, uh, coverages, Sorry, we don't have the length. I took that out and instead replaced it with RMSE. That's a typo. And what you see here is in terms of the, in terms of accuracy for the means, really all methods for pi and mu are very, very similar. They're all really accurate. The Hellinger is in some sense the most accurate across all parameters, but by and large, there's not much difference between the methods. Now, where there is some difference is in corresponding to the posterior credible sets, i.e. their width, right? The posterior standard deviation. What you see here is by, by pretty much in all cases or in basically all cases, the Wasserstein has the widest credible sets. It also actually translates into over coverage for the Wasserstein. The other guys, their coverages are pretty, pretty good with this guy for the CVM not being great. But generally speaking, what this shows is that you can ditch summaries and use these alternative distance measures and you're actually not gonna to be too far off exact inference. Now, of course, in this case, inference here is gonna take a bit longer to run. I'm using the ABC SMC sampler of the Moran co-authors and to get the exact base, I'm using nuts and it takes you know, no, no time at all, right? To, to estimate this thing in nuts. But nuts is of course something, something else. And I was actually doing it in Stan if I remember correctly. It's just, it happens so quick, it's ridiculous. Okay, so let's now move on to another test example to show you this, this phenomena or this behavior happens not just in one example, but in at least two. And so I'm gonna to return to what is quite possibly this literature's favorite example, the G and K quantile distribution example, which is in a sense a little fictitious, but works quite well for our purposes. So I think we've seen the G and K in at least, in at least two, talk, two talks. So I'm gonna kind of be very quick here. The density has no closed form. However, it does have a quantile function, which means you, you can kind of numerically get an estimate of the density and form a likelihood from that numerical estimate. But the quantile function is, is defined by four parameters. You have the location A, the scale B, the, the parameter G, which controls the skewness, and K, which controls the kurtosis. I'm going to kind of specify what I think are pretty standard priors for this. And I'm not going to show you any posteriors. What we're going to do is just a repeated sampling exercise here. We're going to compare exact bays, the Wasserstein, and CVM. I left the, the Hellinger out here because in some sense it's the slowest to run um, because you have to integrate the density. And it's just kind of a pain in, pain in the butt in that case. So I did this quickly. But the Hellinger is going to give us similar results too, which I have in the paper, but I just haven't put them in this. We're gonna generate 100 observations according to these parameter values and do 100 replications. Here's some details on the uh, ABC sampler I used, just the stock standard kind of ABC SMC sampler. We're gonna have uh, 1,024 particles and about 500,000 total simulations. Now for exact bays, you can actually get at the likelihood numerically uh, using a numerical estimate of the density and then plug this into a Metropolis Hastings algorithm to sample the exact uh, density. And that's what we've done. And so what you see here is again, the corresponding mean standard deviations, uh, Monte Carlo coverage and the root mean squared errors. One thing to note here is that CVM is again, performing quite well in relation to exact bays. This guy is a function, I think I'm pretty sure of the small sample size, at least when you increase the sample size the Wasserstein does better and comes in line with the others. It could also be a function of the, 
the relatively small number of simulations I've chosen. Uh, I've done smaller scale examples where if you kind of increase, it, it does better. So I think that's probably partly what's going on. OK, so by and large, what these examples really show is that you know, what we would hope would, would, would this would happen, i.e. we're kind of meeting our first goal of efficient inference at least, in the sense that we're going to not be too far off from exact Bayes when exact Bayes is indeed feasible. But to my mind, the more important question is, David, can I quickly ask you a question from the chats? Um, yes, of course. Chris Trivandi asks, what's the nominal co coverage in these uh, in these results? Thanks, Chris. They're supposed to be 95%. Yeah. So these are supposed to be 95% intervals. Yep. Um, yeah, that was my bad. And so again, we have a kind of a bit of over coverage uh, with the Wasserstein. This exact over coverage I should have mentioned, I'm pretty sure it's because I'm using a, a pretty uh, noisy estimate of the density. I'm pretty sure with additional so basically like you have to choose this grid right to, to estimate the density i'm pretty sure if i chose a smaller grid a finer grid the numbers for the exact would probably be better and indeed i think chris actually has some results for some other stuff where he shows that this is actually much better when you use a finer grid but uh, i'll get to that i'll talk very briefly about that at the end shouldn't exactly be exactly 95 yeah so it's it should exact be no, it shouldn't any finite sample be 95% because exact Christian is exact Bayes, right? So there's sampling error for it. And so it may not be exactly 95%. I'm also only using 100 replications, right? If I did a million replications, it might be a hell of a lot closer to 95 than what I'm giving here. So with 100 replications, it overcovers. However, if I did a million, who knows what would happen? My feeling is it would be much closer actually to 95. It'd at least be pretty much in line with the rest of them. OK, so to my mind, the first piece, the first piece is pretty well settled in the sense that, at least in these examples, you know, it shows that you can get stuff that's pretty close to exact Bayes. And what indeed I do show theoretically is that if you use the Hellinger, you get resulting point estimators that are efficient. But to my mind, the more important question is, how do these approaches work when the model's misspecified? And this is kind of a continuation of something, uh, stuff I've been doing for the last few years and shows my inherent bias and where I'm interested in ABC work as, as a whole, or just kind of statistical analysis as a whole, I think. Really, the starting point here for me is this assumption that all likelihood-free methods, all simulation-based methods are kind of dealing with, which is that you basically have to believe that for some member in the family, the data is generated from something close to at least that model. And I, I think, you know, given the fact that the models we're working with in ABC and BSL and likelihood free methods in general are extremely complicated, the likelihood of this being satisfied is basically zero. And so really we need to think about what we're getting and how it relates to the possibility that these models are misspecified. And this is actually quite important because as Christian and Judith and I showed in, in a paper that was published this year, Really, all of the behavior about ABC when the model's wrong changes as the summaries change. And this is actually a, a pretty big deviation from the case where the model is correctly specified, where the summaries don't necessarily matter as much and the norm doesn't matter at all, in a sense. So really here, when the model's wrong, posterior concentration, i.e. where the posterior concentrates on in a limit, really depends on both the summary and the norm you choose. More importantly, though, what we showed is that ABC displays non-standard asymptotic behavior. The resulting posterior, posterior credible sets don't have correct coverage. They even don't converge at the standard rate. They don't converge to a Gaussian at all. They converge to something else. Moreover, what I've been able to recently show in some work with Chris and also some work with Chris and David Knott that's ongoing is that the situation's arguably worse for BSL in the sense that what you can show is that the posterior may not even concentrate actually. It may not concentrate onto a finite set of values. It may concentrate onto a finite collection of values, not one value, or it may concentrate onto a dense set of values, actually. And I'll talk a bit about this at the very end. So if I guess the, the point I'm trying to make here is that if you're using these methods, you should be damn sure that what you're doing is actually not running ABC, BSL, any of these when the model's wrong. So to kind of illustrate this, I want to go back to this mixture example. 
basically what we're going to do is we're going to keep the same assumed model. So this is exactly the same two component mixture. But what we're going to do now is we're going to contaminate this model. We're going to contaminate it with a few particularly large outliers by having the actual data be generated IID from what is kind of like a three component mixture, but not really. It's a mixture of a two component mixture and a one, and a, and a one component mixture. And we're going to basically control the level of contamination by controlling the mixing component, i.e. The, the, the mixing proportion, and basically the location and scale of this third Gaussian component. What this basically is going to operate like is throwing outliers into the data, right? So we're going to have this nice bimodal distribution. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw outliers in it, depending on what the sign of zeta is. And then what we're going to do is we're going to compare exact Bayes, WABC, HABC, and kind of this Kramer von Mises ABC. In the case where I'm going to fix alpha to be 5%, so only 5% of the data is contaminated, I'm going to have a very small variance of 0.01. And I'm going to look across a grid of values for zeta. So I'm going to allow kind of the location of that contamination to change. The same values for theta are going to be as before. I'm going to generate a sample size of n equal 100, and then we're going to go. The point to make here, though, is that I'm not contaminating a huge percentage of the data, right? Only, five, only at most five outliers in the data. And so let's look at what happens to the posteriors of the ABC methods and exact bays when I have a very large value of this contamination location. And what you see here is exactly the same plots we had earlier, the same color coding. The cyan is uh, the Hellinger. This kind of pink is a CVM. The purple is the Wasserstein. And the green is, again, exact. And what you can see is that relative to the ABC methods, the exact goes crazy. Like it just moves much stronger towards kind of this, this, this level of contamination, moves it much more than any of the ABC approaches. And it's particularly, particularly bad here for the sigma one parameter, where all of the ABC densities stack up very nicely. And this guy just goes nuts to the other side. And so this one, 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 one reason, one thing we can do here then is to look at the evolution of the posterior means as you change the zeta values. And again, I've, I've controlled the error in this generation process so that all that's changing is the value of zeta, actually. And so any change you can see is, is purely a change due to a fluctuation in zeta and nothing else, assuming Monte Carlo error for the posteriors is low, which I've sampled them well enough, hopefully, here that they are. So the thing to note here is across all the parameters, the exact base posterior just explodes once we get towards the tails of the kind of region of uh, where the outliers become very, very large, right? Interestingly, the Kramer von Mises ABC and the Wasserstein ABC are really both very stable. The Hellinger is also very stable, but has these large fluctuations at certain pieces. And I'll explain exactly why this is a bit later. So let's look at how this repeated sampling behavior moves out as we kind of look at a particularly large value. But the, and we're going to do this again by just comparing posterior mean, standard deviations, credible sets, and coverages. And I'm going to do this at a large value of zeta so I can really kind of see what's going on with exact bays and all the other procedures uh, and see if this plot I have here is just going to be true in repeated samples or I just happen to draw a sample that everything stacks up nicely for ABC and not exact bays. And well, I'm actually talking about this, so you can probably tell that it's going to turn out to be pretty good for ABC and not for exact bays. So again, same thing as earlier. I have posterior means across the replications, the standard deviations, the coverages, and the corresponding root mean squared error. Numbers in red are particularly interesting in that they display very poor behavior. What you can see here analyzing the means is that by, by and large, exact bays, the posterior means are much further away than the ABC means relative to the quote unquote true values, where the true values are here. Moreover, the standard deviations from exact bays are also much bigger than all of the other ABC standard deviations, except perhaps in these two cases where it doesn't do too terribly. Interestingly enough, the coverages for exact bays are absolutely atrocious. In particular, this guy is just shocking, a 2% coverage. And it's all because of this large bias and this relatively small standard deviation you get from exact inference. 
Interestingly enough, a similar behavior is actually observed in the Wasserstein. I was actually quite surprised to see that the Hellinger does pretty well here. Okay, so what, what, does this really, what does this really show? This really shows that in terms of misspecified models, these alternative distance functions in ABC do pretty damn well in terms of controlling what is explosive behavior in a likelihood setting by using distances that may or may not get you efficiency, but are generally built to ensure that deviations from the, null hypothesis, from the underlying modeling assumptions are somewhat controlled. So what theoretical results do we have on this so far? Well, the first thing we have is posterior concentration. And this falls directly actually from uh, our earlier biometric result. The proof is basically exactly the same. The only thing you have to do is adjust for the fact that the CVM distance actually is not a norm in the sense that uh, it doesn't necessarily satisfy the triangle inequality. What you can do though, is you can show that if, you know, if you're looking at, at your model and your, your parameters are such that you can upper bound or lower bound that CVM distance across the parameters by another distance, which itself satisfies the triangle inequality, then you get posterior concentration. This actually is, is satisfied for any model that's going to have compact support for the parameters. So for instance, it would automatically be satisfied in the GNK example. And the mixture example, the priors would just have to be tighter, I would think, and you would get, a, you would get exactly the same thing. Okay, so of particular importance here is the fact that we already know that for both the Hellinger distance and the CVM, those point estimators built from minimizing those distances actually have very nice properties. They have two properties. In terms, in terms of the Hellinger, the resulting point estimators are actually efficient, i.e. they reach the kramer rao lower bound. Now, in terms of robustness to model misspecification, what's also been shown is that these estimators are so-called minimax robust to deviations lying in certain neighborhoods to the actual DGP. What I mean here is, for instance, if you take the Hellinger, then if the true DGP lies in a shrinking ball around that Hellinger distance, i.e. If, if the true model is not the assumed model, but is close enough in terms of the Hellinger distance, then you get automatic robustness of the Hellinger point estimators. And the same thing is true of the CVM where you replace the Hellinger distance with just an L1 or L2 distance between the CDFs of the observed and simulated models. So that's quite nice because it basically means that, you know, in terms of contaminations, for instance, like we had earlier, the CVM is actually optimally robust, which is why it performs so well. And it is also precisely why in the case of the Hellinger, you see these sort of crazy loops that happen. And it's all to do with the fact that in this sort of contaminated density, as I've given right here, the Hellinger is actually not minimax robust against densities of this form, even though the, the CVM is. So what I'm currently trying to do trying to show and what I still have to complete and why this paper is not in some sense submitted uh, is to show that these point estimators are actually asymptotically equivalent to the resulting Hellinger and Kramer von Mises estimators. Because once you get this, you automatically inherit then the robustness and efficiency of the resulting uh, frequentist point estimators. So once I get that done, I'll go ahead and submit the paper, but I'm currently stuck. And so I've asked a friend to come and help me and I'm just kind of waiting to see if uh, anything hopefully comes of that. Hopefully it will soon, but that's, I am not in any rush here in a sense. Okay, so I'll go ahead and conclude, partially conclude, because I'm gonna show one little other thing before I actually conclude. So what is the goal of this paper been? The goal of this paper is really to try and, to try and uh, look at whether or not we can get efficient and stable inferences in complex models by ditching summaries in favor of other distances. I think it's reasonable, assume, it's reasonable to me to assume at least that the models we're working with are misspecified and therefore any approach we take in ABC, BSL, any of these likely free methods should somehow at least hedge against this, I think. So basically my idea here was to propose a new approach based on altering the norm 
used in ABC and the, the corresponding kind of choices of the summaries, if you will, replacing those with empirical estimates of the CDFs and the norm with a robust norm to try and mitigate the impact of model misspecification without sacrificing efficiency. <clears throat> what I've hopefully convinced you of, at least in these examples, is that in terms of comparison with likelihood-based methods, the models work pretty well and are comparable, at least, if not better in certain, certain instances to the Wasserstein ABC. As I said, there's still some theoretical behavior to be completed. So really, I want to talk a little bit about, with the remaining time I have, what I see as future work in this vein, because I, I actually do think that the use of these non-summary based uh, ABC measures is quite a very useful way of heading. However, I'm going to preempt this with a caveat in that I am almost certain that there are situations in which good summaries can beat the pants off of these measures. So for instance, if I have a very good auxiliary model approach, so for instance, if kind of some of the stuff that, that Chris and others have done on using indirect inference type of likelihood based free, free likelihood free methods, or the kind of stuff that Gail, Christian and I have done with using uh, kind of simpler filtered based models in, in state space settings, I think you're likely to beat these methods in those situations, at least when the model is correctly specified. Now, in the case where the model is misspecified, it becomes more interesting, right? Because then the choice of summaries dictates how you perform. However, even there, I think cleverly chosen summaries can still cater for misspecification and possibly outperform these non-summary based measures. And I'm going to give you a little example of that right now in the corresponding, uh, in a, a simple misspecified moving average model of order one. So our belief here is that the observed data is generated according to a simple MA1 model. Our beliefs about the parameter are that, of course, it's invertible, which in this case just means it's between plus or minus one. And we're going to have our prior beliefs over this be uniform. This is such a simple example, but it's going to illustrate exactly what I want it to, that even if you choose, if you can choose very, very informative summaries, you can beat all of the measures I've just talked about. Okay, so what we're going to choose as our summaries are the class of auto covariances, and we're just going to choose the first two, right? Technically, I'd even have to just to choose one here, and I would still be able to do this because I have you know more summaries than parameters. But I'm going to choose the first summary, which is the variance, and the first order auto covariance. Now, the thing to note here is that. This is my assumed model, but my true model is actually going to be a stochastic volatility model. Now, the thing about the stochastic volatility model is that it has no autocorrelation in the levels. So its auto covariances are zero in population of all order. Its second order autocorrelations, however, are what have, sorry, its second, its autocorrelations are in second order, i.e. its variances and its covariances. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna generate a thousand observations from this model with very standard parameter values for what are the ARSV. And we're gonna compare BSL, ABC, Wasserstein ABC, the Hellinger, and the CVM. And what you can see from this plot is that what you would expect is that all the posteriors would concentrate around zero, right? Because as I said before, zero is what autocorrelation this model has. So it's exactly what autocorrelation the MA1 should pick up. ABC by far does the best. It pins the location much better than every single one of them, followed closely actually by the Wasserstein. The CVM and the Hellinger are centered at the right location, but they have much, much more uncertainty associated with them. Now, what happens with BSL here is extremely interesting actually. So if you notice BSL, it actually has two modes. It actually has two modes, one at minus one and one at plus one. And what Chris and David and I have actually been able to show is that this is because the synthetic likelihood is actually multimodal in this example. And so the synthetic likelihood is multimodal and you actually get posterior concentration onto two modes in this case using BSL. And so we're working on, uh, working on other, other research where we kind of characterize this general context. And what you can show is that generally speaking, when the model's wrong, BSL can converge on multiple modes i.e. you don't have anything like a Bernstein von Mises theorem at all, versus you still do an ABC, although it's you know, slightly non-standard in a sense. You don't even get concentration onto a point. You get concentration onto multiple points or a dense set of points. 
But what this really illustrates more broadly, though, in my opinion, is that even though these kind of non-summary based measures perform very, very well and give you ways of obviating having to choose summaries, they are not a panacea. You still have to think very, very carefully about your model, the corresponding types of misspecification you might have, and how you want to try and be robust to that, I think. And so I think that's all I'm going to say on this topic. I'm quite happy to take any questions you have uh, about, about anything related to this research or kind of any other ABC questions. Thanks, guys. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, David. Um, so do we have any questions? Uh, so you can either raise your hands um, or put one in the chats. Okay, so we have a question for, from Pat L. So I'll read it out so that people can hear it in the recording. Uh, Thanks for the nice talk. The contaminated example makes me wonder about heavy tail data. My intuition of Wasserstein ABC for very heavy tail data, e.g. Pareto, is that it would overfit any large observed outliers. Would CVM or some other approach help with that? Yeah, so what, what you, that's, a, that's a very good question, Pat. Um, I, I don't know if it can be characterized as generally as that. I've definitely seen a similar behavior, though, in playing around with the Wasserstein ABC, that if it has very heavy tails, it can kind of spread out the posterior too much. The thing about, about, about the CVM that it may be helpful is that the CVM is actually robust to contaminators. It's actually robust to outliers, a certain percentage of them. It has what's referred to as a very low breakdown point in regards to outliers. And so what that means is that you can get quite a few outliers in, in the sample and CVM will still obtain a good location for that, for that point. What will happen is that the tails will thicken out a bit, but its location will still be right there. And in some sense, the CVM is, is optimally robust to certain types of contamination, but not others. So really, if you think of contamination as outliers, then yeah, it may be, but there are still types of contaminants that can break it down. And so it really is kind of very contamination specific, I think, if that answers your question. Okay, so we've got a couple of hands up. Uh, Michael Goodman and Christian. Uh, should we go with Michael first, if you want to unmute yourself and ask, ask your question? Okay, thanks David for the interesting talk. Uh, Michael here. I was wondering how the approaches would scale with the dimensionality of the data, <laughs> why, and um, perhaps then also more generally, what kind of data are, are supported by, by the approach? So like in particular, like structured data. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really good question. So what this is gonna work well for is, okay, so the first, I think I break the question down to scalar data and multivariate data. So. I, in this paper, I've only looked at multivariate data. However, the CVM distance using a projection average version will allow you to do multivariate data pretty easily. Now, in terms of what kind of data it's going to be best for, this seems to work. I, I've used it in some kind of INID settings, and it doesn't seem to work as well as settings where you have kind of weak dependence or settings where you have data that's pretty close to being IID. And so if you have kind of clustering data, so maybe lattice data or stuff like that, I, I don't really know how it's going to work here. Um, one thing to note, though, is in those cases, the Hellinger actually, if the probabilities are discrete, the Hellinger may actually work pretty well. Um, I, I don't really know kind of what types of data you're thinking. So if, maybe if you want to give some ideas, I can, I can kind of play off that. But because I, I don't know exactly what you mean by structured data, Mike. Okay, um, so for example, if the data comes in the form of a tree or um, perhaps so matrix kind of these branching examples, value right? data. Yeah, I, I, mean, I don't think I have a, a particular uh, idea of data in mind. I was more wondering what, you know, what, so, what so assumptions you're making. Yeah, um, yeah. So one of the big assumptions here and one of the reasons why I haven't, you know, really pushed it much harder than it possibly uh, maybe could be pushed is that the Hellinger is not going to work if you don't actually have data that has a continuous density or a discrete density, right? So if it has a mixed density, you don't, you don't want to be using the Hellinger. 
because any sort of non-parametric estimator you're going to get of that is going to be not very good, I think, unless you're using a kind of automatically a mixed type estimator there. The CVM, because it's based on the ECDF, is probably going to be pretty fine regardless of the type of data you use. Now, of course, with tree data, you're going to have other issues to deal with, and I'm not exactly certain what will be best there. Um, I mean, that's actually a really interesting point that I haven't, that I haven't much thought about. Thanks for the question, though. OK, thank you. OK, so we have a question for, or oh, Christian has his hand up as well. Yeah, OK. Uh, well, first, thanks. Thanks for a great talk, David. Uh, I really enjoyed thanks, it, Chris. but it, it raised uh, some integration in me that I mean, try, trying to play de devil's advocate. Um, as, as a Bayesian, I wonder where where we end up if, if we pursue that the trail in that I mean the, the since the exact base output is is worse in in your illustrations, um, where should we stop? That it should we should we eventually get rid of the prior or or try to estimate the prior from the data? Because if consistency is the, or minimaxity is 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 the only um, argument or, or is the main argument, then, then the I mean first we have we have diluted the meaning of the of the likelihood. Yeah. Have we reach a point where where we also dilute the, the meaning of the prior? Yeah. Yeah. I I mean you you philosophically I completely agree with you. Uh, I mean I've chosen this example to be provocative. I think more so more so than than anything. I I mean this is one example where you would you would never actually fit that mixture model to it because looking at the data, it would be abundantly clear that this isn't a two component mixture model. And so the, the argument I would make here is there's some sort of model checking, model diagnostic that you would do beforehand to alleviate the situations from a practical standpoint, at least, right? Now, what you can also show is that if you reduce, if you reduce that misspecification in a sense, so if you can kind of look at this area of the curve, right, where I'm not so extreme in terms of the misspecification, then the procedures are still very similar. But what it means there is you're going to get behavior more akin to this sort of behavior than this kind of crazy situation I've built where uh, exact Bayes is nuts and kind of we should we should we should be doing something else. My, my I guess that what I'm saying it's a very long-winded way of saying. I would never do ABC in this example. I would just fit a better damn model. Yeah, but and philosophically, it, it, it is interesting that it 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 could bring a a form of empirical base that we would we would start with a prior and and observing strong mm -hmm. discrepancies, and we as as we are rewriting the likelihood into this empirical likelihood, we could have an empirical prior as well. It's yeah, just a, a very light ID, but yeah, I mean, I think I think what we're kind of talking about is 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 rounds of model and likelihoods kind of restructuring as the as the structure moves on, right? As I, I fit once, I go, okay, this doesn't work. I need to do something else. Let me refit, right? Yeah. And so this kind of circular uh, model diagnostic model fitting approach, I think, would be would be quite useful. And I think there is some I think I, I, the, the point I would make here is that what you're likely to get with these robust approaches then is kind of a better, a better vision of what ground truth is in a sense. Mm -hmm. And so you can always have a benchmark then to compare against. Exa I mean, there's, I'm not saying that exact Bayes is not the benchmark here because it still is, but you, the threshold to cross for me to switch from exact Bayes or doing this is that, is that robust threshold. Once I get something that's looking better than this robust threshold, which I know works when the model's wrong, then I'm going to go with exact base. I guess that's that's kind of the way I'm looking at the the, the model building diagram in a sense and the the evaluation diagram. Mm -hmm. Does that does that answer your question, Christian? Yeah. Okay. Good. Thanks. Thanks. It's a great question. Okay. So Tom Goodwin has his hand up. Uh, so Tom, yeah, if you can unmute and then ask your question. Oh, so thanks, thanks for the talk, David. I appreciate it. I, I think thanks, um, I think your your um, your MA one <laughs> example was 
was very provocative as well because because as Chris showed in one of his papers that the the MA2 in BSL works quite well, um, especially using um, the full data set uh, as instead of summary. So I mean, people always talk about summary, 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 especially for the BSL stuff and, and a lot of this ABC yeah. stuff. But have you have you had any experience with using full data sets on the BSL and not just summarizing it? Um, especially for the MA the MA models, I know that as Chris rightly showed that it's it's quite a good uh, you know a good a good solution to the posterior. Yeah, so so in that BSL case, what Chris and I have actually showed in an earlier version of a paper we have at, at JCG we have under revision at JCGS um, is that the MA two actually doesn't work when the model's wrong, and so in this case where the where the data is SV then at least if you're using kind of even a high dimensional collection of summaries there, the BSL posterior still has this behavior. Now, I, I agree that when the model is correct, then using kind of data-based points in BSL is going to work quite well. The difficulty there is that what you're basically doing, and the reason I wouldn't say that there's a direct parallel between kind of what I'm suggesting in BSL is that if you look at the, the distance here, right? that BSL uses, it's basically a Maha Nobles distance. And so what this variance would then be would be like the variance of the individual data points, right? But each one of those data points has variance, has no variance, or its variance is extremely small, right? And so I, I think as you increase the number of data points in that collection, you're going to start having issues, at least if you use the canonical BSL variance. Now, of course, if you do some sort of regularized version, right, which which Chris and his co-authors have also done, you're likely, you're likely to get some different behavior there. And so this argument I have about using the Mahanobles distance then goes away. And I completely agree with that. Um, I generally think using the kind of data matching in BSL is going to work up to a point. And it's gonna be very dependent on the structure of the data actually, I think. So if you have very heavily dependent data, so for instance, if I don't have an MA1, but I have, I have an AR1, then I think you're going to have much more issue actually trying to do that. Um, but that's my feeling. Maybe Chris has other thoughts on it. I don't really know. Thanks for the question, Tom. Did I answer your question? Yeah, thanks, Ben. Cool. So David, I have a quick question. Um, it's about uh, ABC approximation error and the, the ABC threshold. Yeah. Um, so when you're using Euclidean distance with uh, summary statistics of a fixed size, there's all these um, all these asymptotics about the error that you get, and cursive dimensionality type results. Is is there an analog for these distances, and do you think any of them can can do better in terms of this approximation error? Ah, oh, Dennis, that is a really great question. Actually, um, the one thing I can say off the top of my head is that asymptotically, the the distance is gonna is gonna the kind of what's gonna come out of having to choose that tolerance is probably gonna change. Because the basically like what you need is some sort of concentration result for this norm. And so I already know, for instance, that in the case of the Wasserstein, the concentration results in the standard Wasserstein uh, are actually dimension dependent, right? So as the dimension of the data scales, not, well, not with n, but with d, then you don't you get kind of different rates. Now, I don't know. Now I know you in the in the case of the CVM at least, and in the Hellinger, you get the kind of standard root n concentration, so that shouldn't affect the asymptotics too much. But that's completely obviating like your finite sample Monte Carlo error approximation, right? The kind of Bloom and uh, the Bloom JASA stuff, and some of the stuff that you have with with Paul. I have no idea what's going to happen there actually in finite sample and kind of looking at the ABC approximation error relative to the to the exact posterior. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. I, I have no idea. It's a very good point. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any, any other final questions from anybody? Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, David. Um, yeah, so uh, if you want to give David a virtual round of applause in the chat or by, uh, by clapping on the video. Uh, so thanks very much for taking part. I'll stop the video now. Uh, if anybody, anybody wants to stick around and ask any, any quick final questions to David, then feel free to do so.